Almighty and most merciful Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, Creator, Redeemer, Sustainer, Victor, El Shaddai, Jehovah, help our minds and thoughts, feelings, give us insights and retentiveness of memory, help us to see the whole scope of things from the least to the greatest in the fields of the academy and help us to exalt your name above all the disciplines that have marginalized and removed you. Help us to fight that quarrel that you are exalted above all of them. Help us to peer into the essence of arguments human motivations, as well as Lord Jesus shine in our hearts. We may be clean things up where we need to fix certain thoughts. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. Well, we're back with uh, Dr. McNeil in his work, The History and Character of Calvinism. Chapter 10, Calvin and Farrell have been removed by the syndics from Geneva. During, and Calvin goes to Strasbourg. During Calvin's three years at Strasbourg, that city was a flourishing center of the Reformation. Evangelical worship had been introduced as early as 1524. When Diebald Schwartz, a young cleric, introduced a German translation of the Mass with alterations reflecting Lutheran beliefs. Later, Busso and Capito had succeed, succeeded in establishing good order in the Strasbourg church with a full program of preaching, sacraments, catechizing, and mutual edification in group life. Their complicated plan for a board of lay workers, Kirk and Flegger, three from each of the seven parishes, to cooperate with ministers in visitation, discipline, and church government was in operation within the limits prescribed by the magistrates who reserved to themselves the power of excommunication. Jacob Sturm, 1489 to 1553, will recognize he's a the same time frame as Cranmer, who for many years headed the government of the city, an able statesman, a father of the country, Alsace, and widely respected in Europe, had supported the cause of Reformation and had been the principal founder of primary schools. Latin schools, and a school for the children of refugees. The Paris-trained humanist, John Sturm, 1507-89, to 89, not a relative of Jacob, had just been installed as rector of Strasbourg Gymnasium, which was to make the most renowned and successful of Renaissance schools. He, too, was wholly committed to the Reformation, though he remained one of the most liberal-minded of Protestants, long continuing friendly relations with Roman Catholics and hoping for Christian reunion. Calvin Strasbourg period was much more than an interruption of his activities in Geneva. Both church and school had much to teach him, and he was in a mood to learn. From the very first, he was welcomed, befriended, and advised by Booser, who was 18 years his senior, and for whose judgment and opinions he had high respect. With John Sturm, whom Calvin had known as a recognized scholar in Paris, he was soon on terms of intimate friendship. They were separated in age by only two years and from the same general region of France. 
Sturm's birthplace was Slade and near Aix la Chapelle, and John Sladen, the historian, who chose to be known by the name of the village, was his friend and schoolfellow. Sladen visited Strasbourg more than once while Calvin was there, became his correspondent in numerous notices in Sladen's history of the Reformation, testify to his appreciation of Calvin's work. Sturm's objective in teaching is summarized as the inculcation of a sapiens et eloquens piatas, or as he otherwise expressed it, to form men who are pious, learned, and capable of expressing themselves well. The curriculum was heavily weighted with classical literature, Cicero overshadowing all other authors. Sturm promptly appointed Calvin a lecturer in the Holy Scripture. Later, the gymnasium would expand into an academy with a wide curriculum. Calvin's teaching and that of Busser served toward the preparation of candidates for ministry. Calvin participated happily, happily in Sturm's school, would later prove a useful model for his academy at Geneva. In January 1539, Calvin informed Farrell that Capito had induced him to give public lectures so that he would either lecture or preach daily. He was also appointed pastor of the French refugee congregation. It had been the policy of Jacob Sturm and of the ministers to welcome persecuted evangelicals to Strasbourg, and most of those who came were French-speaking. Florimond de Raymond called Strasbourg the receptacle of France's exiles. The generous wife of Matthew Zell, one of Busser's colleagues, had announced the hospitable pa uh, policy. Whoever recognizes in Jesus, the true Son of God, the only Savior, may boldly present himself at our house. We will receive him under our roof and at our table. One day we also will have a part with them in the kingdom of God. Lutherans, Zwinglians, Schwenkfeldians, Anabaptists, the wise and the foolish, according to Paul's phrase, all have free access to our home. Zell and Capito harbored many distressed fugitives for religion, and Busser's house near the church of St. Thomas was, for the same reason, called the Inn of Righteousness. The French colony in Strasbourg had listened to the preaching of Farrell in 1525, when a number of families had arrived and men so distinguished as Lefevre and Roussel were in their midst. But the refugees came and went. No organized congregation had been formed and they were without any preacher when Calvin undertook to be their minister. He preached his first sermon to them on September 8, 1538. The following July, he had become a citizen of Strasbourg and a member of the Guild of Tailors. Busser had described the French community as a little company, and Calvin sometimes called his Strasbourg Ecclesio Ecclesiola Gallicana. the little French church. It seems to have numbered some hundreds. An estimate for a few years later is a little under 500. The congregation of the first met in the church of St. Nicholas near the southern wall of the city. Two months later, it was removed to the chapel of the penitents, Franciscans on the left side of the River L. Once it migrated again in 1541 to the church 
of the Dominicans. Next to the old convent that housed John Sturm's school, as a preacher, Kelvin was well received. After a favorable beginning, he wrote to Farrell, the brethren intend wherever there is evidence of a little church to permit the administration of the supper. Walloons and others speaking French, we're told, were present when in November the sacrament was celebrated in the church chapel of the penitents. It must have been a memorable experience for the exiles and not least for Calvin himself. The atmosphere of fraternal trust and holy gladness was marked in contrast with the troubled scene in Geneva a few months before. The little French church was remarkable for the hearty congregational singing practiced in its worship. In 1545, a Walloon student in Strasbourg wrote to a friend in Antwerp that he'd been unable to refrain from weeping for joy during the first days of his sojourn where all men and women joined together in solemnity. You would not believe the joy, he wrote, you would not believe the joy that is experienced in singing the praises of the Lord in the mother tongue as is done here. Each one has in his hand a book of music. The book of music had been compiled by Calvin and published at Strasbourg in 1539. It was entitled Alcun Psalms et Cantiques Miss and Chant some psalms and canticles with notes and contain 17 psalms in French meter, one in prose and the Apostles' Creed, all set to music. Psalm 25, 36, 46, 91, and 138 of this collection were Calvin's own texts. The other psalms were by Clement Marot, court poet of France, and satirist of abuses strongly inclined toward Protestantism, <clears throat> who had been with Calvin at the court of Ferrara in 1536, see page 30. A number of Moreau's French psalms were sung at the French court and were circulated in manuscript for years before their publication in 1542. Indeed, a pirated edition with alterations of the text appeared at Antwerp in 1531. Apparently from a manuscript of this altered version, as yet unpublished, Calvin obtained the 12 of Moreau's psalms that were included in the book. Calvin's five psalms of 1539 were inferior to those of Moreau, yet not without merit. He also presented the Ten Commandments with introductory and concluding stanzas in a poem of twelve quatrains to be sung in church. His best poem, Je tu salut, mon certain redempte wur, an utterance of warm and personal faith, appeared first in the 1545 Geneva edition of the Psalter. During the conference at Varms in 1540, he found time to write a controversial Latin poem entitled Epinicium, Attacking the Papacy. Later, Calvin abandoned the writing of verses, having a low opinion of his success in this art. He substituted Moreau's versions for his own in the edition of the Psalter. Calvin's theory of church praise is best understood from his preface to his Psalter of 1542 and its later enlargement. Basically, he identifies singing in public worship with prayer. Public prayers, he says, are of both kinds, spoken and sung. St. Paul authorizes both. And in truth, we know by experience that singing has great force and vigor 
to move and inflame the hearts of men to invoke and praise God with a more vehement and ardent zeal. Calvin's experience of this has been gained for the most part at Strasbourg, as we have seen. He had expressed himself similarly in 1537. It is interesting that in the earlier, the French refugees at Strasbourg had been a singing group. Gerard Roussel, in retreat there in 1525, when Farrell was a preacher to them, wrote to Bishop Ricanet, the singing of the women mingling with the voices of the men produces a marvelous effect, most pleasing to hear. Even at that time, versions of the Psalms in French were beginning to gain circulation. If the psalm singing practice had been interrupted, it was now resumed under Calvin. We saw that he had planned to introduce the exercise in the Geneva church. Now he had his great opportunity and he made the most of it. Back in Geneva in 1543, he wrote a thoughtful addition to the preface of 1542, to which he we have referred. And this he incorporated in the 1549 edition of the book. Here he has in mind the extension of psalm singing to houses and fields. He wants the human voice to become an organ of praise to God. Music, he says, is the first gift of God, or one of the first, for man's recreation and pleasure. We ought carefully to avoid permitting it to serve dissoluteness and lasciviousness. He cites Plato and St. Paul, and claims music in words and melody for morality and worship. It has the power to enter the heart like wine poured into a vessel with good or evil effect. When we have sought thoroughly, we shall find no songs more suitable than the Psalms of David. Since they are inspired scripture, when we sing them, God puts the words in our mouth as if he himself sang with us to extol his glory. Chrysostom bids women and little children as well as men who custom themselves with psalm singing is a sort of meditation to associate them with the company of the angels. Malinet, Nightingale, and Parrot may sing well, but it is peculiar to man to sing with intelligence, heart, and affection. The book provides the opportunity to commit to memory these divine and heavenly hymns of David in order never to cease from singing and to the exclusion of songs that are frivolous, dull, or vile. The music was to serve the text, not vice versa, to match and convey the weight and majesty of the words. As preacher, pastor, and lecturer, Calvin labored hard. He was able to keep in touch with the members of his relatively small congregation to give thoughtful attention to its discipline and worship and to shape these in accordance with the principles and demands of the actual conditions. The Strasbourg authorities gave him a free hand. A plan of discipline was introduced in the spring of 1539 apparently by action of a congregational meeting, encouraged his people when in trouble to come to him for counsel and consolation, and sought in private interviews the amendment of lives. In Easter 1540, he required a personal examination before admission to communion. He required students to lay aside the swords they liked to wear to classrooms. And a more an immoral student was excluded from communion until he repented. The Kirk and Flegger system of Strasbourg extended to the French congregation. John Sladen served for a time in that office at Calvin's side. 
Calvin's form of public worship in Strasbourg was of historical significance. We know it from his book of liturgy, the form of prayers and manner of ministering the sacrament according to the use of the ancient church. This manual was printed in 1540, but the Strasbourg edition of 1542 is the earliest extant. In that year, too, a slightly different edition appeared in Geneva, and the third Strasbourg edition in 1545 contains an explanation of the various steps in the service of the Eucharist, and as is usual with Calvin, advocates frequent communion. In Strasbourg, he tried to obtain consent for a weekly communion, but the magistrates permitted it only monthly. Calvin's design was to restore essential features of the worship of the ancient church. His main set source for the form of prayers was Busser's liturgy which was a free modification of that of debauched farts. The outline of the Roman Mass is still readily discernible in Calvin's Eucharist. Indeed, at the beginning, he recovered the words of Psalm 124, 7. Our help is in the name of the Lord. Retained by Schwartz from the penitential preparation of the Mass, but not in Busser's revision. He did not, however, restore the Sursum Corda, which Busser had also omitted. The prayer of confession is followed by a declaration by the minister of absolution from sin <coughs> for all who truly repent. This is followed by the singing of the first table of the Decalogue, Commandments 1 to 4 each commandment being followed by the Kyrie eleison, eleison. After short prayer, the commandments of the second table are sung. This treatment of the commandments illustrates Calvin's emphasis upon the moral law and no less upon the value <clears throat> of singing and worship. The sermon, the collection of alms and long paraphrase of the Lord's Prayer lead to a communion rite. The first consecration prayer is mainly Calvin's own composition. It begins, Heavenly Father, full of all goodness and mercy, craves the faith that Christ, perceives Christ as the truth, in truth, the holy bread of heaven for our vivification and grace to magnify the name of God by words and works. After the words of institution, Calvin introduces an exhortation in which an exalted view of the grace of the sacrament is coupled with warnings against participation of unfit persons in the holy mystery. The latter feature known became known as fencing, of the tables. At this point, Calvin had been anticipated by Pharaoh in his liturgy of 1525, entitled La Maniere et Fossum Quon Taint S. Lu Que Dieu de Sa Grace a Visites. The 1533 edition of this liturgy explicitly warns away those who have not true faith as well as idolaters, perjurers, frivolous persons, those disobedient to parents and rulers, those who injure and hate their neighbors, the drunken and dissolute, and all who live wickedly and against the holy commandments of God. Calvin's language is similar but more formal. In the name and by the authority of our Lord Jesus Christ, I excommunicate all idolaters, blasphemers, condemners of God, heretics, and all who form separate sects to break the unity of church, the church, 
perjurers, all those who are disobedient to their fathers and mothers and to their superiors, all seditious, unruly, violent, injurious persons, adulterers, rakes, thieves, ravishers, the covetous, the drunken, the gluttonous, and all who live a scandalous and dissolute life, declaring to them that they must withdraw from this holy table from fear of polluting and contaminating the sacred food that our Savior Jesus Christ gives to none but the faithful of his household. Calvin includes in this exhortation a summary expression of his doctrine of the Eucharist. Christ, he states, wishes us to participate truly in his body and blood that we may so completely possess him that he lives in us and we in him. Quote, and though we see only bread and wine, nevertheless, let us not doubt that he accomplishes in our souls spiritually all that he shows us outwardly by these visible signs. That is to say that he is the, the heavenly bread to refresh us and nourish us unto eternal life. He is, he saw it, says Calvin, in the earthly and corruptible elements that we see and touch. Our souls must be raised to heaven and must enter the kingdom of God where he dwells. We should regard the bread and wine as signs and testimonies and seek the truth spiritually where the word of God promises that we shall find it. The minister then notifies the people to come reverently to the holy table. He himself first receives the bread and wine and gives the bread to the deacon and to all the communicants, saying, Take eat the body of Jesus, which is delivered unto death for you. The deacon presents the wine, saying, This is the cup of the New Testament of the blood of Jesus, which is poured for out, out for you. During the distribution of the elements, the congregation sings Psalm 138. A noble prayer of thanksgiving and aspiration follows, including a petition for growth in the faith that is effectual to all good works. The service closes with the nunc dimittis and the benediction from number 6, 24 to 26. The marriage service in Pharaoh's Monnier at Fasson was incorporated in Calvin's form of prayers. It was short and simple. Included in the husband's vow are the words as agreeable to the evangelical precepts and in the wife's as is prescribed and commanded in the sacred word of God. The direction for the office of visitation of the sick leaves all details to the discretion of the minister. At Strasbourg, Calvin wrote a number of notable books besides those mentioned above. His commentary on Romans was published in 1539. It was a product of the lectures on epistles of St. Paul begun in Geneva and continued in Strasbourg. This earliest of Calvin's Bible commentaries is one of his best. It is dedicated to his Basel friend, Simon Grineus, with whom he had once discussed the principles of Bible interpretation and who had agreed with him on the importance of clearness combined with brevity. He briefly characterizes the commentaries of Melanchthon, Bollinger, and with special approval, Booser, whose work is, however, too extended and too profound for humble and not very attentive readers. Booser was known as a chatterbox. In May 1540, Calvin wrote his, with similar discrimination, about Capito, Zwingli, Luther, 
and Oikolampadius as expositors of Isaiah. Calvin's commentary on Romans has been in circulation ever since its appearance. He shared Luther's admiration for this epistle, but gave more weight than Luther to historical and philosophical points. But unlike Melanchthon, he did not concentrate on difficult passages to the neglect of simpler ones of equal value. The commentator on Seneca was now to be the eminent commentator on the entire New Testament, except for the book of Revelation, a book which he acknowledged he could not fathom. And on all but 11 books of the Old Testament, most of his commentaries on the New Testament had appeared by 1550. Isaiah, the first of the Old Testament, 1551. Throughout these extensive works, he adheres to his conception of the commentator's task and employs his extraordinary resources of knowledge with surpassing clarity and insight. In 1540, the year of his first form of prayers, Calvin published in French his little treatise on the Holy Supper of our Lord, a simple and lucid exposition in the form of 60 brief chapters with titles. It is excellently designed as a layman's handbook on the controverted doctrine of the Eucharist and in its form and style bears a resemblance to his instruction in faith of 1537. It will be best to postpone discussion of Calvin's handling of the theme. It may be remarked, however, that a mystical element is present in his exposition of it, and that he stresses the sinfulness of irreverent participation along with the importance of frequent communion. In the closing sections of his little treatise, he seeks to bring mutual understanding and agreement between the Zwinglian and Lutheran disputants. In 1545, the book was published in Latin and was thus made available to Luther. Melanchthon's son-in-law, Christopher Pezel, reports that Luther picked it up in a bookshop and praised it highly, saying, I might have entrusted the whole affair of this controversy to Calvin from the beginning. If my opponents had done the like, we should soon have been reconciled. Another writing of this time is, Car is Calvin's reply to Satellato, celebrated as one of the ablest controversial tracts. Jacobo Sotoletto, 1477-1547, 40 years, Calvin Sr., Bishop of Carpentras in the Dauphine and one of the Cardinals, appointed by Paul III in 1536, was one of the most admirable leaders of the reforming party among the hierarchy. In his encounter with Calvin, we see the first notable challenge of the Counter-Reformation seeking the recovery of Protestant territory. Calvin and Farrell having been expelled from Geneva, there seemed an opportunity to secure the return of the bishop to Geneva, Pierre de la Baume, and the restoration of the city Geneva to the papal obedience. With this in end view, Satelletto wrote to the Geneva magistrates a persuasive Latin letter urging the necessity of unity with Rome and imputing the basest of motives to the reformers. Unmoved by this argument, the magistrates, having consulted with the ministers of Bern, invited Calvin to answer the cardinal's letter. Since in the previous year they had driven the reformer out in anger, this course of action was doubtless not expected by Satelletto. Calvin's reply, 
dated 1 September 1539, written in six days. It shows due respect for Sadaletto's learning and worth, but with devastating eloquence dissolves his argument and hurls back his accusations. We've already mentioned certain passages in reply that shed light on Calvin's conversion. A marked feature of the piece is the way in which the Protestant conception of the true Catholic Church sharply confronts the medieval view represented by his opponent. Calvin passionately repudiates the charge of schism from the true church. The Protestant layman testifies that the evangelical leaders spoke nobly of the church and the minister called to judgment declares that his conscience does not accuse him of having lapsed from the church. Quote, unless indeed one ought to be held a deserter who, seeing the soldiers disordered and dispersed and departed far from their ranks, raises aloft the ensign of a commander and summons them back to their posts. Close quote. Such was the reformer's view of the Reformation, a rallying of the disorderly ranks of the faithful. He protests his devotion to the unity of the true church, which is based upon the word of God, not the claims of men. And thus he ends this manifesto. May God bring to pass, O Sarletto, that you and all your persuasion may perceive that there is no other bond of unity than this, that Jesus Christ, who has reconciled us to God, the Father, should gather us again from this disorder and unite us into the communion of his body, that through his one word and spirit, we may grow together in heart and one soul. Close quote. A few weeks after this letter was written, Pierre Caroli appeared in Strasbourg, charging Calvin with deriding the creeds and with anti-Trinitarian heresy. He sought to turn Bucer and Capito away from him. At Zell's house, Calvin let him go in a fit of anger, of which he wrote 8 October to Farrell, I have sinned gravely. Graviter Pacavi, Pacavi. The incident is of little importance as evidence of a personality defect in Calvin, an ungovernable temper under provocation, which he himself called the wild beast. Caroli's charge was so absurd that Calvin would have done better to smile than to fume. Strasbourg was in contact with the whole 16th century reform movement and was now concerned with the efforts of the emperor to pacify religious parties through negotiations in imperial diets. Calvin's letters of March 1539 show him at a convention in Frankfurt where he had a long conversation with Melanchthon reports that Melanchthon shares his views on the Lord's Supper, but he is disquieted by Melanchthon's willingness to make concessions to the emperor. He attended the succeeding conferences at Hagenau and Varms, 1540, and Regensburg, 1541. He sometimes found himself at variance with his Protestant associates who seemed to him to be insufficiently on guard against damaging concessions to the Roman negotiators. The Regensburg were Gaspero Contarini and other Roman Catholic theologians conceded the substance of Luther's doctrine of justification. The hope of reunion of Lutherans with the papacy was seriously undermined by some on both sides. But Luther was not there, 
Paul III was not committed to the views expressed by his own emissaries. Calvin saw the futility and artificiality of the long drawn out discussions and was impatient with Bucer and Melanchthon for their resort to ambiguous formulae in order to secure the appearance of an agreement. Calvin's letters are among the most important sources and documents for these conferences. They do not indicate, however, that he took a prominent part in them. Evidently, he participated without enthusiasm. At the end of a letter describing the Hagano discussions, he observes that the opposing theologians do nothing but amuse themselves and remarks wryly that his own sole object and that of Capito in attending the conference is recreation, 28 July, 1540. <clears throat> and the same letter, however, affirms on the Protestant side in <clears throat> inflexible resolution to advance the kingdom of Christ. His primary aim in the relation of the churches was to overcome the alienation between the Lutherans and Zwinglians, which he saw, would prove a tragic hindrance to the advance of Protestantism. In Strasbourg, Calvin occupied a conveniently located apartment where he had a housekeeper and kept a pension for a few students, thus adding something to the meager one floor in a week that was a belated allowance from the government treasury. The students had been attracted by Calvin's fame and in his house formed a group for instruction and prayer. In May 1539, we have the first evidence that he began to think of marriage. He's 30 years old now at this point. He confided to Farrell that the beauty he desired in a wife was that she be modest obliging, not fastidious, thrifty, patient, and likely to care for his health. His friends proposed in turn two possible choices. He thought the first unsuitable because she was an aristocrat and did not know French. When he was expecting to marry the other, he had information about her that caused him to break off the relationship and he made his own choice from among his parishioners. Early in August 1540, he married. He was married by Pharaoh to Idolette de, de Bure, the widow of an artisan from Liege, Jean Storter, who'd been among Calvin Strasbourg converts from Anabaptism and who had fallen to the plague. Idolette was the mother of a teenage boy a student to whom Calvin showed kindness, and of a younger girl, Judith, who resided in the Calvin home until her marriage in Geneva. Calvin's marriage would have been one of unsullied happiness had not both parties suffered much from ill health. Idolette became an invalid, and Calvin was increasingly distressed by numerous ailments. On 7 and 10 April, 1549, he wrote to and for Farrell respectively, reporting his wife's then recent death. These letters reveal his profound grief, his deep attachment to her, and his high admiration for her qualities. Late in the following year, referring to her as the most exemplary woman he stated his intention to lead a solitary life. He had shared with her disappointments and griefs. A son born in 1542 died in infancy. A severe wound, wrote Calvin then, but our father knows what is best for his children. When enemies scoffed at him for having no offspring, he answered that God had given him countless spiritual sons. Less than a year after Calvin's departure from Geneva, 
the magistrates began to discuss his recall to Geneva. Hostile parties contended over the city's policy toward Bern. The Artichauds were so nicknamed by a play on the word articulants because their platform was a set of articles of agreement with Bern. The opposing Willer Willerman, so-called from Guilame Farrell, regarded the expulsion of the reformers as a blunder and worked for Calvin's return. New severe regulations were introduced, but could not be enforced. The four ministers then laboring in Geneva were unable to give competent leadership to the church in so critical a time. The two of these who'd been commissioned to Geneva by Bern, Antoine Marco and Jean Moran resigned and left the city in September 1540. The suppression of a riot staged by the Artichauds had left the Guillermans in the ascendant the previous July. On September 21, 1540, the Little Council voted that Kelvin should be returned. Recalled, two deputations and numerous communications from the Geneva councils were employed to convince him. Emissaries finding in Strasbourg that he was in Varms rode on thither in haste. A letter of 22 October, sent on behalf of the councils and signed by the syndics, was sealed with the motto, Post Tenebras, Spero Lucum, After the Darkness. I hope for light. This is the basis of Geneva's Reformation motto, post tenebras lux. The remaining ministers supported the plea in extravagant language. Calvin expressed privately his genuine dread of Geneva and long declined the call. Yet he had formerly felt sure that he had been divinely appointed to labor there, and a sense of obligation to the city and its church still haunted him. His correspondence gives proof that the decision to return cost him a struggle. The Strasburgers, too, did what they could to retain him, finally persuaded by letters from Switzerland. Busser consented to his going for a time only. Farrell was plying him with appeals in his urgent, prophetic vein. Calvin received imploring petitions from the Swiss Protestant communities and from individuals who thought his leadership in Geneva was vital to the hopes of Protestantism. His own letters increasingly implied ultimate acceptance, but he insisted on fulfilling his appointment from Strasbourg as a deputy to the Regensburg Conference. In June 1541, however, he left the conference under escort of a herald sent by Geneva. Returning to Strasbourg, he prepared to depart. Busser and the Strasbourg magistrate still insisted that after a sojourn in Geneva, he should return to them. They urged him to keep his Strasbourg citizenry and salary. He declined the latter, but complied with the former proposal. On 1 September, he set off to resume his labors and conflicts in the city of which he had written to Pierre Vier six months before, quote, there is no place under heaven that I am more afraid of, close quote. Having renewed friendships in Basel, intervened helpfully in a church quarrel in Nucatel, and paid his respects to the leaders in Bern, he was welcomed with public acclaim in Geneva on 13 September, 1541. And here we'll draw chapter 10 to a conclusion before going on to his work in Geneva, its reorganization, 
its struggle and its victory. Let us pray. Almighty God, give to us men in our time, anew and afresh, with vigor and power, as expositors of your infallible word. Exalt yourself, Lord God Almighty, in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. We draw this to a close.